The Titanic carried 3,300 passengers and crew. Nearly half of them lost their lives on the night of April 14, 1912. But the stories of the Titanic live on. On the ship were millionaires, artists, fashionistas, bakers, cookers, musicians, doctors, and con men. These are their stories. Welcome to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on the last night on the Titanic, looking at the lives and all the different people who were there on that fateful night. And what can we learn from the Titanic and its sinking when we look at all the different people that we don't necessarily consider? The bakers, the helpers, the trendsetters, doctors, uh, all these other figures. And we're joined with our expert on the Titanic, and that's Veronica Hinkey. Veronica, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today for this episode about the musicians. Yeah, I think this is something that if there's a touchstone on the Titanic, it's the musicians. There's been times when I've seen the movie Titanic, uh, the 1997 one parodied. And one element that always gets parodied are the musicians going down. Uh, One that sticks out in my mind, I don't know why, is um, the Simpsons movie from 2007, I think it's animated versions of Green Day, and they're somehow sinking, and they put away their guitars and get out violins to play, and they're saying, gentlemen, it's been an honor playing with you tonight. So that's an iconic element. The romantic idea, I I totally get it. You are being brave and valiant and continuing your craft and your arts to the very, very end. Something we're going to look at is to see, did it actually happen in that way? Let's start out with the different accounts about what people say happened with the musicians on board. And we've already mentioned some in this podcast series. Can you tell me about some of the descriptions and accounts that we have about the band playing on? When I first started researching for this book, I had always brushed over this aspect of the Titanic thinking, well, surely the band played Nearer My God to Thee because that's what I grew up hearing about. But then I was watching different interviews and reading stories. And I watched a BBC interview. Uh, It's a wonderful interview with um, Gerson Cohen and others, Edith Rosenbaum, Russell and, and more. And it talks about this topic. And um, if you have a chance, you know, definitely log on to YouTube and look for it because what really startled me for the first time ever was listening to Edith Russell saying that, you know, to think that the band was playing near my God to thee, she said it would have been a ghastly, horrible lie. She said, you know, if they had been playing that song, people would have been discouraged. They would have thought our, our lives are going to end. And the band is, you know, heralding that in and uh, nothing could have been further from the truth. She said, um, and third plus third class passenger, Gerson Cohen, who was very outspoken about his accounts, he agreed. He said that the band did not play as the ship went down. He said he heard the band playing when the boat struck the iceberg, when he was trying to get on deck, but when he decided to jump, he saw the musicians standing back and holding their instruments. So um, many different accounts are out there. Um, Colonel Archibald Gracie said that he heard a cheerful tune that he couldn't recognize. He said that if it had been near my God to thee, he surely would have recognized it. And he would have regarded it as a tactless warning of immediate death to all of us and likely to create panic. And that's when I started to feel very naive about this, you know, belief that I had assumed for all these years that they were playing near my God to thee. Uh, who are some of the people who claimed that that's what the band was playing? I think Eva Hart, was she one? Yes, she was. And um, she claimed that she heard the band playing Near My God to Thee as the the ship went completely under. What were some other alternatives that people put forward that the band would have been playing instead of that? There's a few that I think you've mentioned in your book, other hymns. What What do you think would have been playing in its place? There's a popular belief that they were playing the hymn Autumn, which talks about, you know, shall we meet again in autumn? So it's it's also a very somber, kind of a sad song, but not not nearly with the same connotation as Near My God to Thee. Right. I mean, you wouldn't be playing practically a funeral dirge or something that was so melancholy, but try to lift people up. Just to give a little bit more context about the role of the musicians on the Titanic, 
how essential was the role of musicians on the Titanic? And this is something that I think we have to step out of our 21st century perspective, because when we think of musicians playing so-called classical instruments, violins, pianos, we think of one person in a hotel lobby or a four-star restaurant with someone on the harp. But music was just different in the early 20th century when you don't have recorded music in the same way. So what role did they have on the Titanic? In Collier's Weekly in May of that year, after the Titanic sunk, there was a story in which Helen Churchill Candy was explaining that after dinner, there was coffee served at little tables around the the lounging areas, and the orchestra would play. Um, They would play at ad hoc different times and different places all throughout the ship. And I love the story, you know, when we talk about the more – somber songs that are rumored to be what the band played as the Titanic went down. I love the story that's very different from that, which is when the first violinist, John Jock Hume, is running on the stairs and runs into his friend, Violet Jessup. Uh, He knew her from working aboard other ships. Um, He told her, you know, we're just going to go play a few tunes to cheer people up. And um, so that, again, that's another claim in in favor of how the band was really focused on keeping spirits high that night, um, even after the Titanic struck the iceberg. And remember, this was after everyone had gone to bed. Even the smoking rooms were closing down and everyone would have been shut down for the night. Every room would have been shut down. Edith Rosenbaum Russell had just left the library as it was closing. But the band did play on. Even after that time, you know, we 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 do know this one account for sure that um, Violet Jessup said that she ran into Jock Hume and he said that they were, you know, getting together and they were going to play some music to cheer people up, which I think is incredibly admirable. Just as an aside with Violet Hume, probably one of the luckiest or most unlucky people on earth when it comes to ship sinkings. How many did she survive? She survived three sinkings. Now, the Titanic, the Britannic, and the Olympic were sister ships. Um, The Titanic sunk. The Olympic did not actually sink, even though it's included in that that phrase sinkings it's it didn't sink it it went on to sail for many many years but um it was in an accident and her life was in jeopardy it was hit by a royal navy vessel the hms hawk and it was hit by the um navy vessel which was designed to ram into other ships and the olympics hull was damaged below the waterline but she managed to escape unharmed and then of course um, the, the the captain at the time, speaking of unlucky, was also Captain John Smith, who was the captain aboard the Titanic that night. Yeah, rough going when you have a lot of these same people who've been on similar vessels. But some people manage to just know how to make it out of these situations. Looking at these accounts, uh, you went through a number of them trying to figure out, okay, based on what I can see, I have a good suspicion of what did or didn't happen. So if we look at Jock Hume specifically and his fellow band members, from what you can tell based on different accounts, what did they do when the Titanic began to sink? As I mentioned, you know, Im- imagine these these guys. They pick up their instruments and start playing when everyone's, you know, go- rushing to the boat deck and ready to take their orders and crew are loading up those lifeboats. Even though, you know, in the very beginning, people didn't know that it was as serious as it was. So they weren't necessarily anxious to get in those lifeboats. But even still, I think there must have been some level of anxiety among everyone that there had been an accident. Yet still, the band, they played on. They found all sorts of different songs to play to cheer people up. So I understand on the wreckage site that they found something related to musicians that adds a whole new dimension about their experience. What did they find on the wreckage side of the Titanic? Right. It was really neat, you know, as we're always trying to figure out what were the the songs that the band were playing, was playing, and what were these musicians playing on their um, their instruments. And ironically, we know for sure of one song because the sheet music was found at the Titanic wreck site. Can you imagine? That's amazing that survived underwater. 
Right. And it is another clue that they were really in tune to playing upbeat music and songs. It was called Some of These Days, which was written by uh, Shelton Brooks in 1910. So, you know, it would have been on like, you know, around those 1910, 1911, it would have been on like the top 10 list of songs that young people listen to. And so we know that they probably played that or they were going to at least. Well, another thing, uh, I guess we'd be remiss if we didn't look in one more part of Jock Hume's life. There was something that was perhaps waiting for him at home. So can you tell me something else about Jock Hume? Right. There's, you know, there's a book, several books that have been written about Jock Hume. Jock was the first violinist aboard the Titanic. He had worked on other ships as well. And uh, when he left England to go and work on the Titanic in this wonderful capacity, the first violinist on one of the most magnificent ships ever, the Titanic, um, he left and did not know at the time, or we're not sure if he knew, but his girlfriend was pregnant. Um, He also as his great grandson, Christopher Ward was able to research and find out that for many years, the Titanic fund was paying uh, monthly stipends to a woman in Jamaica. And she was the mother of a child that Jock had fathered while he was there in Jamaica. Uh, Well, he had worked in, in a ship and worked back out in a ship and, um, he was the father of a child in Jamaica as well. So he's a sailor at heart in some ways, a lady at every port. That's what I thought too. It's kind of, that's probably, you know, an example of how um, the lady in every port kind of uh, mystique of those who travel for work, how that might have come about. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, I'm very interested and excited about this culinary spotlight because it's probably my top three favorite cocktails. I think over the course of this podcast, I've mentioned this one specifically different times when episodes focus on drink have come up. And this one ties into our subject matter because the person after whom it's named shares a hometown of Jock Hume. So can you tell me about this cocktail? Yes. And I'm so glad to hear it's one of your favorites. I think it's just so filled with history. I'm not surprised to hear that. It's one of your favorites. Uh, So the Robert Burns cocktail, uh, Dumfries, Scotland is where Jock Hume was from. That's where he left his girlfriend to go and work on the Titanic. And unbeknownst to him, you know, several months later, uh, after he perished aboard the Titanic, his, his child was born um, a little girl And Robert Burns was from Dumfries, Scotland. Now, there's some debate over whether the Robert Burns cocktail is truly named after Robert Burns or someone else. But um, I like to think it's named after the poet (laughs) and the author, (laughs) just just because I like that story, I guess. Um, But he's also the author of Old Lang Syne, which, of course, you know – Jock Hume and his bandmates would have known Old Lang Syne by heart. I'm sure it was so popular to musicians back then. Um, you know, Robert Burns is a national treasure of Scotland, and he is the pride of Dumfries, the hometown of both him and Jock Hume. And um, the Robert Burns has a really interesting garnish. It's not a lemon or lime or orange peel or anything like that. It's a shortbread cookie. What else, right, from Scotland? (laughs) But a shortbread cookie. So it's usually served, uh, you know, the martini glass on a little plate with two or three cookies. That is how it was served to me first at the Waldorf Astoria in Peacock Alley. Um, And it was you know, just a a really neat experience to have a cookie with my martini. What is your preference? Uh, I know it can be made different ways. You can have absinthe or Benedictine. So which variant do you prefer? Well, good point. So Frank Caifa, who is the, who was the bar manager at the Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria and redid the Waldorf Astoria bar book. He is the person who turned me on to this drink, Scott, many years ago And he also turned me on to the aspect of adding a little touch of Benedictine liqueur. 
uh, about a quarter of an ounce added to the basic recipe. Now, the basic recipe is two ounces of blended scotch whiskey, an ounce of vermouth, two dashes of absinthe, and a dash of Regan's orange bitters. A little bit of lemon twist in there, and of course the shortbread cookies, and you're you're all set with your um, Robert Burns cocktail. But this other version, the only difference is a little bit of Benedictine liqueur. And the reason I love that is because they found Benedictine bottles at the Titanic wreck site. So we know that Benedictine would have been something that would have surely flowed at, at the bars on the Titanic. Okay, that's a more historically accurate version. If you like more floral tasting drinks, let's say, then Benedictine is good. Absinthe turns some people off. I'm personally a fan, but I also like black licorice growing up. So if you like that aniseed taste, then there you go. A little bit of absinthe is your way to go. For the shortbread cookie recipe, that's part of our spotlight today too. And um, that recipe is one of my families. It's a family favorite. It's wonderful with a little powdered sugar on it, but doesn't need to have powdered sugar on it. And you can make it with or without pecans uh, in it. And I think that people will really like to uh, try that shortbread cookie with the the um, cocktail as well. All right. Well, all of these variants uh, we discussed it might sound a little bit confusing, but if you check out the show notes for this episode, this recipe spotlight is available in detail, as are all the other ones and all the other episodes. While we're nearing the end of the series, we have one more profile to go. We're going to be looking at a group of people that are probably part of any major event, that is doctors. So we're going to look at doctors that were there on the Titanic, but also a few quacks as well. So we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. To listen to all the episodes in the series, go to lastnightonthetitanicpodcast.com. There you'll also find show notes, biographical profiles of the passengers and crew on the Titanic, and recipes for all the recipe spotlights that we do in the series. One last thing, if you like the show, please rate and review it on the podcast listener of your choice. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.